Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take two data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, with you from Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor is with us in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, the second half of the show, we will be talking about... The Godfather, not either of our Godfathers, but the Godfather movie, which is happens to be marking its 50th anniversary, and we'll be digging into some of the economics involved in that. Adam, do you remember the, the first time you saw The Godfather? No, oh, absolutely. Yeah, my dad took me to a screening in his lab. There was like a cinema club in, in the lab, and he said, it took me and my brother, and it was... I don't know, maybe 10, 11. So it was quite shocking. Huh. I mean, left a, left a profound impression. 10? Yeah, oh. we, were, we were young. Like, it was, it was, it was hardcore. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I, I, I don't think I saw it till college. And I do recall being around 10, actually. I remember seeing the VHS cassettes at my friend Jimmy Asaro's house. This sort of, you know, family from the Sicilian diaspora in Long Island. And they had all of the sort of six... VHS cassettes of all of the Godfathers and wondering what it was, but it took me a few more years to see it, I guess. But anyway, we will be talking about that in just a bit. But first, as always, we're going to be digging into something from the news. And the news data point for this week is 100,000. That is the approximate number of people that are estimated to still be in the city of Mariupol in Ukraine as it's suffering a siege and bombardment from the Russian military. That's about a quarter of the normal population. The brutality of the Russian onslaught on Mariupol grows more dire by the hour. The blockade of Mariupol will go down in history of responsibility for war crimes. People lining up for supplies, cooking what little food they have in the streets. A dead body on a bench. It's hard to know what exactly is going on there right now? There aren't any journalists left in the city who can report to the outside world, but what we do know is pretty horrific. Uh, there is not much food, no water, really. The remaining residents had been relying on melted snow, but that's apparently now all gone. And the Russian military, as far as we can tell, has just been pretty indiscriminate in its bombing. I mean, destroying much of the housing and basic infrastructure. For anyone who's left behind, there's not really a clear way out. And, you know, when Russia invaded Ukraine in the first place, there was a lot of talk about how we should all prepare for scenes of urban warfare. But I don't know, this is something different, it seems to me. It's like total urban destruction, the kind of thing, as far as I know, we haven't seen in Central Europe since World War II. And I don't know, it's kind of hard to get my mind around the horror there right now, but it struck me that maybe the lens of economics it could at least be a starting point for, for trying to understand. So, Adam... Let's start maybe by offering a portrait of this city as it once was. I mean, most of us probably weren't familiar with Mariupol before. I mean, what kind of city should we be imagining? I mean, there are comparisons that come to mind here. What kind of economic role, say, has Mariupol played in modern Ukraine? And how about even further back in its history? Yeah, I mean, it's a city that has a long history, not a, not a truly deep one. It's really defined by its location. Um, it's, a, it's a port city on the Sea of on the Black Sea, but and then more particularly on the Sea of Azov, which is this sort of appendix of the Black Sea that is encircled by the by Crimea, and it was on the trading routes and the on the invasion routes of the Tatars in the 17th century, and there wasn't really much there at the time. A, a port is established in what is now Mariupol in 1778. It acquires its modern name in 1779 in in the honor of a tsarina, and it was used as a dumping ground for. Orthodox Greeks that the Tsarist authorities wanted to get out of the Crimea. And so through to the middle of the 19th century, it's a, a Greek-Russian town speaking a particular type of Greek. Um, a tiny place, maybe 5,000 inhabitants, a little port. Um, but then it gets connected to the railway system and it becomes a major port for coal from the Donets region and for grain. Um, this is also the area where sunflowers are grown for oil um, and wine actually so it's a mixed up town i mean russians jews 
what will become modern Ukrainians start moving there and, and mixing with the Greek population only really in the second half of the 19th century. So I mean, in analogies, it's kind of a, like a... I don't know, like a St. Louis or a Pittsburgh on sea, something like that. It isn't, it isn't a grand port city like Baltimore with all of the wealth that came from cotton and slavery and so on. Um, it's a more hard scrabble place than that. I mean, it's a big, it has one of the biggest steel works in Europe still today that was first started by Belgian entrepreneurs at the turn of the century. And then the Soviets doubled down on it in the 1930s. Like most of the rest of the Ukraine, of course, it was caught up in the horror of the Nazi occupation. Uh, there were about 10,000 Jews um, in the town and before the war, hardly any of them survive a series of Einsatzgruppen killings in 1941. After the war, it has the distinction of being named after what in the Soviet system was its proudest son. I mean, it's renamed after Andrei Zadanov, you know, the... The, the ultimate bootlicking ideological accompaniment to late Stalinism. And it retains that name till 1989. I mean, by that point, it's a sort of the environmental disaster zone. It's one of the most polluted cities um, in the Soviet Union, which is saying something. And the Sea of Azov is sort of dying before your eyes. It's a very shallow uh, strip of water. And then it's caught up in the in the struggles of, of the revolution, the Maidan revolution and the separatist movements, it's on the front lines then already. This has been a city which has essentially been on the front line since 2014. It is, of course, and this has to be said, you know, the site of the notorious Azov battalion and now brigade, the, the really umbilical link between the so-called right sector of the Ukrainian patriotic nationalist movement in 2013, 2014. By all accounts, they are a small fraction of the forces that ultimately are defending Mariupol, but they provide Moscow with the legitimation, if you like, for this claim that Ukraine is dominated by Nazis and you know the population of Mariupol is being held hostage by by fascists. Um, that has its you know its tiny shred of truth in the in the location of the Azov um, battalion um, around Mariupol. Got it. Okay. That was very evocative, the idea of St. Louis, hard scrabble kind of port town. But big cities like this, I mean, are obviously, you know, economic engines. I mean, you were talking about the steel production in the city, in the port. But it got me wondering whether cities are especially vulnerable during wartime like this. I mean, if one found oneself in a major land war, an invasion of this kind, uh, hopefully none of us do but you know would you be better off in a city or in the countryside somewhere what do you think adam yeah it's a question with really horrifying implications which you were touching on in your intro i mean on the one hand cities are if you like places waiting to be turned into fortresses um you know you you can establish roadblocks you can fight in the ruins um they offer tall vantage points for snipers um, for modern armies with their focus on mobility and dynamic maneuver, I mean, they're basically death traps. I mean, many tanks can't elevate their guns or depress them far enough to be able to shoot at buildings at close quarters. So they become very vulnerable to anti-tank weapons, even light anti-tank weapons fired at them from above. Ruins become ramparts. But, but they're also intensely vulnerable because cities can only exist on the basis of the division of labour. They don't fundamentally grow their own food all the way back to the Neolithic. That is the definition of a city. So once you cut them off, they starve. And they also become deeply unsanitary because they're such dense population cities. right? Uh, so so you, you cannot, over a long period of time, survive there without the spread of an infectious disease. Um, but... As a matter of fact, as the population of the world becomes increasingly urbanised, and in the early 21st century or the late 20th century, depending on how you count, the majority of the world's population has begun to live in cities. By necessity, almost armed conflict has increasingly come to centre on um, cities. And as head-on battles between equally matched armies of nations have become less and less common and more and more warfare is asymmetric, if you are on the weaker side, uh, if you're an insurgent movement of some type, it does make sense to retreat to a city simply because of the advantages that it offers the defender. And so we've seen more and more of that kind of warfare. If you think about Fallujah or Mosul in Iraq or the Russian, I mean, the prior, the example for what they're doing in Mariupol is, is clearly Grozny in, in, in Chechnya in the, in the 1990s, which twice they besieged. 
Uh, and, and what you then see is precisely this weird kind of warfare that it's not obvious whether they're attacking the defenders directly or simply trying to bury the defenders in the rubble of the city that they're insisting on defending. And then it becomes something, the term that is used is, is this neologism, it's called herbicide. So it's an attack on the city as such. You just literally flatten block after block. And this has been perpetrated on a small scale, for instance, relatively speaking, in the occupied territories uh, by the Israeli forces, uh, in assaults on, on Gaza, for instance, on a larger scale in Beirut. But I mean, if its origins, you might think back to the Warsaw uprising and the Warsaw ghetto fight um, as models of this, where, where the German army, you know, it was literally an effort to crush the defenders under the collapsing city. Um, rather than a, a military fight on the on the rubble of a city. Okay, goodness. Um, so I want to take a, a closer look at Mariupol right now. I mean, I, I imagine that normal economic activity just entirely stops during a siege like this. But is that to say that economic activity as a whole stops? I mean, what are the economics of just survival during this kind of herbicide that you're talking about yeah i mean the the economy of places like this comes to centers as one would expect around the absolute basics right around food around water around fuel and it, it and it really becomes an absolutely desperate struggle on the inside to preserve order and to avoid a descent into a kind of hobbesian dog eat dog system in which the men with guns are the last people to eat um in the besieged city um, right now in Mariupol, there is apparently a black market, not for meat because that's all gone, but for what remains of vegetables, which were salvaged from one of the wholesale markets that the Russians flattened. There are people scavenging for fuel from abandoned vehicles, draining drinking water from radiators um, to keep themselves going. Um, if this lasts longer, it will become more and more complicated and more and more exploitative. And, and we have, in fact, many examples for this from Syria over the last decade. And one has to insist that the precedent for what we're seeing in, in, in Ukraine right now is Syria. And their incredibly elaborate siege economies have developed because sieges were one of the key ways in which that war was fought. Uh, with Russian participation, of course. And you see the whole gamut of activities then unfolding with middlemen in between um, food supply, fuel supply, prostitution, education going on, beauty parlors even. People have to have their hair cut still if this goes on for months on end just to keep you know, the, their spirits uh, alive. Um, and you see a rapacious and extraordinary business transaction and business networks building up in which the besieging forces basically collaborate with black market traders to supply the city, but at increasingly excessive prices. So essentially, the siege becomes not just an absolute effort to strangle the people in the city, but really a kind of economic race to strip them of all their wealth. Again, we see this in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, with the Jewish population there uh, in 41 and 42. Um, and we actually there can watch it on, on film that was made by the Germans as this was going on. It's, it's an absolutely devastating process. And, and NGOs which are desperately trying to bring supplies in find themselves caught up in hideously invidious choices where the only way to get resources into the city is effectively to collaborate with these black marketeers. In Syria... The ultimate solution for this in many cities was for the city to dig its way out. So the cities would dig tunnels so as to enable them to short circuit this black market economy. And you can measure the effect in falling prices. So at the peak of the sieges, the prices inside the siege will be up to 60 times higher than in Damascus. And then as the tunnels opened up, the prices would collapse back towards something more like a normal level. OK, wow. I'd like to try to tease apart this herbicide strategy a bit more. I mean, is there an economic logic at all to Russia's bombardment of Mariupol? I mean, is it setting back the Ukrainian economy in some qualitative sense right now? Or, I don't know, could this be about setting back the Ukrainian economy in the post-war period? Or is this really just destruction for destruction's sake? I think there is a logic. Um... 
I mean, if there's an economic logic, I think it's on the Russian side. I think they've run out of smart munitions hmm. and they're using the dumb bombs and the dumb artillery that they have plenty of. And that is a cheaper form of warfare from their point of view. It is much lower risk as well. I don't think that they're targeting the city for geoeconomic purposes. The aim of the game is not to, as it were, harm Ukraine by cutting the city off. I don't think in the first instance that's the purpose. What they are after, however, and this is why this goes much further than just simply destruction for destruction's sake, is they want that land bridge, right? They want to be able to connect the Donetsk region, which they control, to Crimea and then the, the foothold that they've established along the Black Sea coastline of of Ukraine in the south. This is the underreported success story in inverted commas of the Russian invasion so far. Some people believe even that if they can take Mariupol, Putin may even be able to declare victory. Um, and um, that, I think, those are the stakes. Um, so this is a cheap, relatively riskless way of achieving what is, from a strategic point of view, rather an important target. It isn't, I don't think, as it were, a deliberate economic strategy to target this city for that reason. But it's not by accident that these cities are where they are, right? Sieges happen in economically significant places because cities are in economically significant places. So, I mean, to look ahead a bit, I mean, when the war is over, I guess talk will turn to reconstruction. And what does history tell us about that process? I mean, do cities of this size even necessarily get rebuilt or are there examples of cities that just then disappear as a result of war like this? I mean, I don't know. Here in Germany, I feel like it's kind of easy to be blithe about that process. I mean, there, there's this standard cliche that gets told of the destruction of World War II, you know, many of the cities getting bombed to the ground. And then that was followed by what they call the Wirtschaftswunder, uh, this period of economic growth and the cities getting rebuilt and, uh, you know, things being on an even sort of higher level after that. First of all, I guess the question is whether that cliche is even true. And second of all, if it is, is that, is that just an exception rather than a rule? If you try to think of cities that have been erased from history by invasion, I think that the lesson really of war is that in, as it were, densely settled European areas where the project is not ultimately genocidal in intent, is in fact cities do come back, and they come back because they are there for very powerful reasons in the first place, right? There are absolutely massive economies of location, of network, interconnection, which mean that cities like um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki come back, um, you know, very dramatically within, within years of the end of the war. They are already restarting. Or Tokyo, that was, of course, devastated by firebombing, or Hamburg, even Berlin, which which after all was cut off from its hinterland. And it was for that reason, the fact that it was cut off from its hinterland, that in West Berlin, bomb damage was still visible all the way through to really the 2000s, right? Which is very rare in Germany. And that's a sign, I think, of the fact of, of which determines reconstruction. It, if the economic connections grow back, then the damage is quite rapidly reabsorbed. Um, if they don't, as in the case of West Berlin, or the economic system changes to one in which, as it were, the, the reproduction of capital, the repair of capital, as we saw in East Berlin, is not prioritised, then the bomb damage lasts. And if you wanted to see what Berlin looked like at the end of World War II, you didn't have to travel very far in East Berlin to see it all the way through to the 1990s. There were houses that were visibly pockmarked by you know, sprays of machine gun fire or shrapnel or whatever. And that was because socialism didn't reinvest in East German socialism, didn't reinvest in, in old building stock. It built new houses instead. Mm. Well, I should also add here that I'm recording this from my apartment, which also was built in the 1980s in one of these former bombed areas in Berlin, uh, right in the middle of the city, and remained empty until money poured in to try to build housing. But yeah, point taken. Um I guess to finally end this uh, segment, I mean, I wonder, is there any economic response by the West that could make a difference right now for Mariupol? Um, do the existing sanctions, at least right now, offer any hope of immediate effects on, on, on the war in Mariupol? I don't think they do, no. I think um, there's just a, an asynchronicity here between the timeline over which the battle in Mariupol will be decided. And it one teeters on the edge of saying one hopes it will be decided quickly, right? This is the agony of a situation like this in a siege. What do you hope for? Do you hope for the population to hold out and to go on fighting? Or do you hope for an end to the agony? 
But in any case, I think the timeline of that ghastly battle will be different from that under which sanctions will work. And, and I think it's virtually unimaginable, given the prestige attached to the victory in this city, that Putin would, would, as it were, step back from the project. I think what the West could reasonably demand and what the wider international community should be demanding, and this is where China, for instance, or Israel or Turkey could play a really helpful role, is in demanding a humanitarian exit for that population so that what's left in the city are fighters, not civilians. Yeah, well, I suppose in the meantime, the rest of us should be thankful that we're not in that kind of horrific situation and, yeah, just hope for the best for the people who are still there. But, yeah, we will end this segment here, but uh, be right back to talk about The Godfather. Hi, welcome back to Ones and Twos. Our next data point is 269,699,963. That's in dollars, and that is the worldwide box office for the first Godfather movie, which came out 50 years ago this week. Maybe I should say there are some spoilers involved. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Barzini's dead. You're my older brother, and I love you. But don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. I don't know. If you haven't seen The Godfather, really, what are you doing? It's been out for 50 years. So uh, anyway, it's your fault if you're exposed to spoilers here. Anyway, we will be talking about the kind of implicit economics of The Godfather's story itself. But I figured maybe we could start with a question about the film as its own economic product. So Francis Ford Coppola... He said recently, I saw that it's unlikely The Godfather could even be made today because studios are only interested in investing in sure thing blockbusters like Marvel movies. That seems kind of crazy to me. I mean, I just mentioned the returns, which are huge, and that was off of a budget of just $6.5 million to make the movie. So I just don't really understand the economics here. Why, Why wouldn't some studios at least prefer to make plenty of money off of movies like this. I mean, like, there is a market opportunity here, right? I mean, just money waiting to be made or, I don't know, is there another relevant constraint here that I'm not catching on to, whether it's capital or talent or distribution? I mean, what do you think, Adam? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And I, I'm i kind of wary of the fact that I'm, I'm so much in sympathy with Coppola on this because makes me feel like a grumpy old man I mean you just kind of I find I find the Marvel franchises which I watch only really over other people's shoulders on airplanes just kind of incomprehensibly tedious I I just (laughs) and and at that point you realize like I am not qualified to comment because I am so not getting this cultural phenomenon but I mean if you dig into it it does kind of make sense right so the logic of filmmaking economically appears to basically bifurcate. It's, it's Imagine it's like two lotteries, because making films like writing books or any other cultural production, right, it's a bit of a lottery. You don't really know what's going to work unless you are doing Marvel superheroes 3.0 or whatever. But that's part of the reason why they do it, because it's more predictable. So imagine two lotteries, and basically the independent filmmaking lottery, where most of films get made is relatively low cost to get into. Say, you know, Godfather budget would still allow you to make a small indie movie today. But on average, they lose money. So you put a relatively small stake in, and some of them will strike it incredibly rich, like Godfather, but on average, they lose money. So there's a long tail of loss-making films which never really earn their money back, even the small amount of money put in. And then there's another lottery where the odds of winning are much higher, where indeed on average the films make substantial money. But to be in that business, you need to be able to front the costs of a 60, 100, 200 million dollar production. Right. So that's really the distinction here is these two different games. And to be a credible player, if you look at the big studios, there's a huge, as it were, asymmetry between the most successful outlets and the other, the also rams. So even in that group, it's highly concentrated. So it's a rather strange business where it's a kind of winner takes all business and your ability to generate those winner takes all returns depends heavily, yes, on networks, on brands, on being able to monopolize the screen. 
What has totally changed the economics of all of this is streaming and Netflix, which is by far and away now the largest in terms of revenue. Um, and, uh, you know, it has a variety of different channels. And as we know, it can milk the niches much more effectively um, than the big studio film productions, which is why I don't find a lot I can watch, you know, in the cinemas, mm. but there's an enormous amount of great stuff to watch in streaming. Yeah, I guess it sounds like uh, that's why uh, the next Godfather will probably be a sort of 10-part Netflix series or something. Well, it's the Sopranos. I mean, this is silly, right? Coppola's just, you know, he's just def- he's denying the fact that it was made and it's the Sopranos. Mm, there you go. Exactly. But is that cinema, I guess? is the Anyway, that's a separate, separate question. Now to turn to the movie. So one of the plot points of The Godfather is that Michael Corleone, the heir of the family business here, is, he's the only one of his siblings to attend college. And this kind of seems to mark his success at strategizing against his rivals and also achieving some legitimacy for his family's empire. Got me wondering, is there evidence of a link there in reality? I mean, between higher education and success at organized uh, crime? Yeah, so this is a fascinating question, and that is a key plot line, isn't it? As it were, Michael Corleone's efforts to sort of escape his fate as the son of the of the Godfather. Um, but this is, it's a, this is a crazy question. And you and I were going back and forth about this earlier today, and I, I put it out on Twitter to ask for help. Because if you Google the question of education and criminality, all you find is overwhelmingly large numbers of studies which show, of course, that... Um, education and crime are negatively correlated. The longer you keep young men in education, the less crime there is. The 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 more young men fail at education, mm-hmm. the more likely they are to become criminal. That's the you know the be all and end all of the entire story. And so there are literally hundreds of thousands of things that come up. But there were a set of studies done in the twenty teens which pointed to something rather more interesting, which is. A look at the group of people who become criminals, especially in organized crime. Does education make a difference? And I just want to give a shout out to the two people on, on Twitter this morning who, <laughs> even more quickly than you were able to get me to this, pointed to this study, which was widely discussed a few years ago, which took a sample of folks convicted for organized crime activities in the US and tracked their education. And it turns out that, especially in the Italian American immigrant community, the rate of return to an extra year of education in criminal activity is really rather significant. Um, So if you're in that community, and on average, the mobsters have less education than the non-mobster peers, but within the mobster group, the Mm. ones who do have more education um, do better, earn more. And and, and unsurprisingly, they tend to go into the more (laughs) STEMI, you know, mathy, wonky areas of crime, like embezzlement and what we were talking about the other day, namely bookmaking. So, yeah, the the movie tracks the life of Michael Corleone as he takes over the family business. But it also kind of offers in flashbacks some narrative about how the family business got started. And it seems to imply that the mafia gets its start in the U.S. because of a failure by the government to enforce order in immigrant communities in New York and Little Italy. I don't know. Is that an accurate depiction of how the mafia gets started? I mean, I I would have thought in the old world uh, that the mafia got started even before the modern state but you tell me adam what do you what do you think it's a super interesting question and one that has been in fact quite intensively researched by economic historians because what the mafia does if you set aside the criminality label right it, the, the question really is is who do you pay for coercion that's really what the mafia story is about viewed from an economic point of view who is paying who for coercive services And what profits do coercive services generate? And so the basic story about the emergence of the Sicilian Mafia, which which was relatively late in the day, the Sicilian Mafia is really attested only in a regularised form as something like a formal organisation from the 1860s onwards. And the argument basically amongst the socioeconomic historians of Sicily is that it emerged because of a disturbance in the previously existing balance of property and coercion. So if you think about a feudal system which prevailed in large parts of Sicily and through to the early 1800s, the large lords, the large landowners, keep their own private armies to defend their property and their cattle and their crops. And as that order breaks down in the course of the 19th century, 
as the large landowners sell off their land and then the Italian state, which takes over Sicily in the 1860s, sells off public land and church land, you have large numbers of small property owners and they can't afford their own private armies. And so the mafia emerges effectively on this economistic reading as, as it were, a contracted out enforcement agency that you as a small landowner end up relying on. Of course, the mafia also ensures that you do. And those cultures then of protection were a transplanted into politics because the mafia needs to get legal immunity and you do that by suborning the judges and the politicians and then exported worldwide because another way of escaping Italian justice is to go to the United States, which is how the mafiosi first came to the US. And there they blend with immigrant mobster organized gangs in pressure cookers like New York, where they are by no means the, you know, the first movers. The first movers are the Irish and then the East European Jews. And so that then kind of widens out. So there's this sort of melting pot of gangsterism in the United States, which does seem to rely on these immigrant communities of self-protection, where you buy protection through connections. So I want to end, I guess, with a bit of literary criticism, I guess, of a kind. I mean, there's a kind of pastoralism in The Godfather, it strikes me, where because there are these scenes from the old country where it seems like the family would have just been better off if they stayed in the old country. They wouldn't have maybe been so, uh, you know, had this avarice, this need to grow in the way that that the new world and its capitalism kind of forces them to. That they, they somehow, they would have just been better off staying in their wine fields, their vineyards, and just kind of having a quieter, amoral, uh, maybe, a relationship to the society. But but then, but but then, remember, remember how that love story ends, right? Because yes. he falls in love with that gorgeous Sicilian he, woman, doesn't he? Yeah. And then they have their marriage and the honeymoon, and then she's shot dead in front of his eyes. Yeah, but that's from the new world, right? The new world comes over to the old world and kills her. Yeah, they end up like blowing up the car. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, but in any case, we should actually. Oh, we, yeah, <laughs> we, we should. Say, we should we, say we owe it to ourselves to, to watch this, and maybe yeah, maybe that maybe that becomes a podcast event. Come watch and discuss The Godfather. Um, but uh, okay, I do think we need to leave it there for now at least. And yeah, we'll be back next week. Okay, that's it for another episode of Ones and Twos. Thanks as always to my co-host Adam Twos. Listeners, as always, we like hearing your feedback. Please email us at podcasts at foreignpolicy.com or tweet us at Ones and Twos Pod. Remember, that's twos as in Adam's name, T-O-O-Z-E. And of course, uh, remember to follow and review us uh, on your favorite podcast app. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It's produced by Laura rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tatey. The executive editor of FP Podcast is Dan Efron. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. 